Well, I want to welcome you to this new summer series we've entitled Heart Matters. And so it's kind of a play on words because we are going to talk about some of the matters of the heart and because our heart matters and sometimes it's the area of our life we look at the least, we dismiss the most, we're confused by how it's made up, but yet we're going to see today that it affects so many critical areas of our lives. I want to welcome those maybe traveling, summer vacation, we're thinking about you. I want to welcome you if you're watching online as well as those watching at 1230. Would you join me in celebrating all of those that may watch this message later? I'm going to ask you if you have your Bibles to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. You may want to circle that, highlight it, put something there as a marker place because for the next few weeks, that's going to be home base, Proverbs 4, 23. It's going to be our anchor verse for the series as we talk about heart matters. And then this week, we're going to lay a foundation. And I'm going to be very thorough for a reason because I don't want to assume anyone really understands when you use the word heart that they really understand what God's perspective is of that. And so this week, we need to lay a foundation as to how we approach this subject. And then over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about specific areas, specific matters of the heart that affect us. And uh, I want you to turn with me as well for this week as we lay a foundation to Ezekiel. Ezekiel, Old Testament passage there, Ezekiel 36, and we're going to start in verse 26. That's in the Old Testament right there after Psalms, there close to Daniel Look it up in the table of contents. There's no condemnation, but I'm also going to put it on the screen. Come on, now we're going to go to one of those Old Testament books there and look at really a fascinating passage. It's going to take me a minute to get there. Before I do, let me take you back over a decade. Take you back to the early days of Milestone Church when I still had hair. Not much, but I had some. Had a young family, and so this story... Uh, makes a little more sense because of just the station of my family. I had no drivers in my house except for me and my wife, and it was a Sunday morning. Back then, we didn't have multiple services and online streaming. No one would tune in. Uh, we were just a small group of people gathered with one Sunday morning service, and it was a typical Sunday morning in a preacher's life. I got up before everyone else kind of preparing, and then the kids began to move around. I had little ones at that time, and so my wife and I would divide and conquer because back then I had all kinds of other responsibilities besides preaching, so I had to show up to the church to kind of check on some of those things. So I was leaving early, had my message prepared there in the middle of my Bible, all gathered together, got my stuff together, walked out the front door. We lived out west of town here, walked out the front door, and when I walked out, my car was gone. The car was gone. Now I have teenage drivers, so I would just think, hey, they took it, but then my wife is inside, and so I realized my car had been stolen. Now, I don't know what happens to someone that steals the preacher's car <laughs> when he's trying to deliver the word of God to the people of God. But it's going to be bad. <laughs> and I hope on Judgment Day I'm close in line to what happens to them at the great white throne of judgment. Not that I'm bitter. But before you get too mad at the thief, I got to confess something to you. I, I, I made it easy because I left the keys in my car. Yes, I did. That, that happened. I made it easy for them. So kind of like it wasn't really stolen, it was just sort of conveniently acquired. Um, they just took it because I left my, my keys in the car. And you say, why would you tell us that story? Well, Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, Kind of big language there, above all else, big thought. This is very important. Guard your heart. Guard your heart for everything. Everybody say everything. Everything flows from it. Everything meaning everything. 
And so what I've found is a lot of times the enemy is coming to steal from us because we know that's what he does. He lies, he deceives, he's only got one move, and he comes to steal and to speak things into the hearts of Uh, in our lives and begin to give us lies to believe and he begins to take from us at that most basic level and yet sometimes we leave the keys in there for him. We, we, We make it real simple to acquire it because we don't know how to guard it and because we're not focused on this area of our lives called our hearts. And so throughout this series we're gonna learn how to put a little more locks and protections around and kind of even understand at a deep level something that for a lot of us is something, again, that we just leave over to the side and we don't really think about a lot. But to be very basic, you're like, okay, guard your heart. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, let me lay it out at a foundational level, the biblical understanding of what the Bible's trying to say to us. And that is that, of course, we are physical beings And in the very center of our bodies, we have an organ. This organ is a pumping machine that pumps to our extremities and to our other organs the life that flows through our blood. And so we have a physical organ, and I don't know that primarily that's what the Bible is talking about here is the physical organ. But more importantly, when the Bible refers to the heart, it's referring to the deepest, most innermost, central part of our beings. It's the part of us that believes. It's the part of us that has conviction, that, 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 that moves towards something that we are unwilling to compromise. It's the part of us that is around our thoughts. You'll learn in this series, we're gonna try to make the connection here between the thinking part of us. I think it's a big area of spiritual growth when you tie the understanding of how you think about the world, how you think about life, how you see the world, how much impact it has on your life. It's the thinking part of us. It's the feeling part of us. It's the part of us that feels and it's the part of us that does. It's the doing part of us. We do what we want to do. We do what we want to do. The older I get, I really do what I want to do. Are you, anybody getting older? Y'all know what I'm saying? I realize as older I get, look, when you're younger, you try to fake it till you make it. When you get older, you're like, if I'm not motivated by it, it's probably not going to happen. Who's fooling who? Nobody's fooling anybody. We do what we want to do. It's the doing part of us. And so God has to work in our motivations for us to do that which pleases him and brings about his plan and purpose for our lives. And so we know this in the practical realm. It's the the biblical word cardia is where we get the word cardiac, cardiologist. So we know about this pumping station in our bodies. And yet even as a culture, we know that there is, even if we don't understand how it works biblically, if we don't know what God's up to biblically, if we don't know about that, we all know that the heart is important and I've been preaching since I was 16 years old, pastoring since I was 21, and I want to say to you, like never before do we have to get to the place of where you touch people's hearts, the numbness of the busyness of our lives, the overwhelming amount of information that comes through our phones, the job I have every single week becomes more and more challenging because of the numbness of the human heart that it's so hard to penetrate through all of that and to get us to feel God, to experience God. We know from a culture though, we want our hearts to be touched. We have this idea that we are led, you know, like let your heart lead you. The heart wants what the heart wants. Trust your heart. I don't feel it in my heart. I wanna be led by my heart. It's over and over in our culture, these phrases, you know. In fact, my daughters, I asked my wife this week, I said, I'm preaching on the heart. What do you think about it? She said, well, when you say heart, I automatically, see, I had sisters and I have lots of girls in my house, so I'm in tune with makeup and also Hallmark, when calls the heart. (laughs) One lady back there just, she she just, she's over. (laughs) And one of the other services, a, a lady went, she don't even believe in that. She, was, she didn't even grow up in a church like that. Wind calls the heart. She gave me one of these. I've not seen it. 
Maybe I need to get in touch with that side of myself. Sounds corny to me. I'm just saying, okay? It sounds cheesy. But that's what we like because here's what we like. We like things that touch our heart. We love it when our heart is full. Can you think of a time in your life when your heart was full? When you had that moment where your kids, you know, it's like they're showing signs of maturity. Wow, my heart is full. Maybe they will make it. Maybe I didn't ruin them. You did something actually responsible and good. My heart is so full right now. What about those moments where we feel love? You know, I mean, even to this day, sometimes during worship, my wife will grab my hand. And like a while ago, well, just a minute ago, when we were praying and she grabs your hand, it's amazing. After all these years of being married, it still warms my heart because I love her. We all have those moments where we experience being asked by someone that we respect to, to take on an initiative or a promotion at work or something that we achieve or something we've dreamed of or some goal or life goal or some new step in life. We love it when our hearts are full. And we also know it when our hearts are broken. One preacher said, if you talk to the broken heart, you will always have a listener on every pew. Well, we don't sit in pews anymore. That even sounds bad, to sit on the pew. But we have nice, comfortable first-class seats for you now. But even in every first-class seat around, there are times in the human heart where we experience brokenness, where our hearts are disappointed, where our hearts are broken. So we all know that there's this innermost being, this, this side to us, this, this place there where things really happen, and we need to ask ourselves what happens to that heart. What happens to that heart? Let's talk about it from a biblical perspective. First of all, that heart, and this is where the cultural narrative is dangerous. When you let your kids wear shirts that say, follow your heart, that's a dangerous statement. When you say, I'm just doing what my heart says, you know, define yourself. Don't let anyone else define you. Let your heart lead you. The problem with that is the biblical perspective of the human heart outside of the message I will give you today is the heart tends to wander. The heart is deceptive. Jeremiah 17 says it is deceived and it is sick outside of God. So we have a tendency to be deceived. If you're that person who goes, I will never be duped, I will never be fooled, you are the most susceptible to deception. The person who postures themselves to say, I have the potential to be deceived, I have the potential to miss it, is positioning themselves in the best place to not be deceived and to approach truth. Our hearts can be wounded, our hearts can be hurt. We have authority figures in relationships and circumstances and situations, and so we carry even patterns of transgressional, if you will, or generational patterns that come down, and it's why we can have woundings in our hearts that will make us make inner vows to say, I will never be like my mom, I will never be like my dad, only to find that if we don't have some type of supernatural fix to our heart, we repeat the patterns of those who have gone before us. And so we have these woundings. And a lot of times if we don't understand the message that we're talking about through this series, we, we, we don't know what to do with it and we end up disillusioned. The heart can be disillusioned. It can start with moderate levels of discouragement and end up in great places of disillusionment. For the first time since 1915, the Center for Disease Control says that in America, life expectancy has gone down. Life expectancy in America has gone down. And you're like, wait a minute, when it comes to heart health, we know everything about our food now. You know, we've got all of it there, sugar-free, gluten-free, it's free of everything, it's so free, we don't know what it is. <laughs> and it's got little hearts and it's fat-free and we don't know if we're supposed to be fat-free or heavy fat, keto, sugar diet, we don't know yet what we're supposed to be doing. But we're very conscious of it. And it's amazing all the stuff we've quit. All my oldest ones are off now, off into their worlds, and so I've got my two youngest daughters now, and the other night, Dad, let's watch a movie. I'm trying to find something that we can have all age ranges can watch, and so we tuned into the Apollo documentary. Anyone seen it? Anyone seen the Apollo, that, that, the whole launch of the moon? Five of you, okay, awesome. But anyway, <laughs> it's, uh, it's very, very intriguing, okay? It's just fascinating, putting a man on the moon. 
And in all these clips, it's all the team in there, you know, the different colored teams, and they're all a part of the little different parts of the rocket launch. And what's amazing is, you know, my kids, they're looking at it going, what are all those people holding those things that are on fire? Because they didn't grow up in a world where it's culturally acceptable that in, you know, public spaces, you're holding a cigarette, so everybody's smoking. You know, back then, everybody smoked, you know? If you smoke, I mean, smoking won't send you to hell, but it will make you smell like you've been there. But anyway. (laughs) uh, And they're all watching the rockets. And so in large proportion, we've realized, okay, this is a medical problem for our hearts. Still the number one killer of Americans is heart disease. Yet I interviewed a guy named John Jay in our area who's a cardio, a cardiac thoracic surgeon, and he said, even though we've done away with cigarettes, we've replaced stress and busyness and diabetes and busyness of life, and we don't tend to our hearts. And so we're still seeing heart disease. Yes, there's genetic factors, and he brought up all kinds of biological factors, but he said, look, there's also this element there of the way we do life. But did you know the reason that life expectancy has gone down, and I know this is heavy, is because of the increase of suicide rates, 30% since 2005, primarily among a more privileged, more blessed, more informationally connected younger generation. Something's happening with all of the right things that we are offering, we don't know the right things to offer the heart of those coming behind us. And I realize there can be mental health and different medical things, but I'm saying to you, the heart can get extremely disillusioned. The next thing it can do is it can get hardened. When we make poor choices, when we move toward the patterns of sin, the heart can get calloused. We get trapped in patterns of behaviors and addictions and things that come that begin to slowly erode and build calluses around our hearts and you can find yourself even in a position or in a place where you can't hear from God or you don't even feel some of the things that come from the goodness of God. It can get hardened. You say, what do we do about it? If we don't know what to do, since in our culture we're dealing with the heart things and we don't know what to do, which we're gonna learn in this series, what does God want us to do? Well, if we don't know what to do, what do we typically do in our culture today? And that is number one, we just ignore it. We all know the person or know of a family member or a situation where a 45 or a 50 year old person, they pass away and we're like, what happened? Well, they had a heart attack. And so what happened was there was arteries that were being clogged, there were disease that began in the heart, and what happened is slowly over time, they were just a little more tired, and over time they were just a little more lethargic, and over time they had maybe just a little bit of some irregularities, but because it was subtle, they just kind of kept pressing through sometimes, or maybe they didn't know at all that they're dealing with blood pressure issues or things or something, and then all of a sudden, boom. Well, that's on the medical side, but let me speak as a pastor. You see it all the time. You see it all the time where you ignore it. You ignore the heart. Look, I don't have time to listen to you. By the way, it's painful to look in the heart. You're like, well, I'm not really into all that. You know, the feeling stuff, the preacher. You know, I'm kind of like, look, man, we just kind of suck it up. You know, we just kind of make it through. We don't have time to look at our hearts, worry about how we feel. Scary to look in your heart. Look over and... Dark stuff in there. More than we like to admit. And so we just ignore it, and we ignore it, and we ignore it, and we have a spiritual heart attack. Remember Proverbs? Out of it flow the issues of your marriage. Out of it flow the relationship you have with your children. Out of it flows the way you respond at work when you get overlooked. Out of it flows so many everything flows out of your heart. 
So some people say, well, look, I don't need to ignore it, so then I'm going to get more religious. So what you're saying, Pastor, is now I need to get more religious, and he's talking about the heart, and preachers talk about the heart, poets talk about the heart, philosophers talk about the heart, so I need new, a new philosophical perspective, and maybe even a new religious perspective, so I'm going to try to do religious things to fix my heart. The only problem is religion can't fix your heart. Religious activity can actually compound the confusion of your heart if you don't even know why you're trying to do what you're doing. Because remember, we do what we want to do. And so religion is never the goal God has. The next one that's very popular in our world today is we'll just improve ourselves. In the same way we are going fat-free, sugar-free, and do, getting this, well, we, we will do that now and we will free ourselves from the spiritual things that could attack our heart. And I will get the TED Talk, the YouTube video, enough podcasts that I can get the right information. And as soon as I get the right information, I will deploy that and I will improve my spiritual heart. And I will get on the, the, the self-betterment program of becoming a more well-rounded, centered, more better off person within my heart. Common in today's culture. None of these are God's prescription. None of these are the way he deals with the heart, which brings me back to the prophetic picture of Ezekiel 36. In Ezekiel 36, you have in a time when God's people were in Babylonian captivity, which is the thesis and theme of the entire Bible is that our hearts wander. That the people of God come to God, God gives them these plans and desires and they begin to worship him, they begin to do these right things and then their hearts lead them astray and then they end up in some type of captivity. It repeated itself over and over throughout the Old Testament, which is a pattern of even the way we are. If, we're, if we let our hearts to themselves, our hearts wander and we end up in captivity, we end up in bondage, we end up just subscribing to the generational patterns that we know, we end up deploying the processes that we understand and we end up in captivity. That's why there's a prophetic picture here of when I say, you say prophetic, what do you mean? It's a forward-looking picture in the Old Testament, the types and the shadows that are revealed in Jesus. The Old Testament is showing us the ultimate culmination that comes through Jesus. And look at this picture. What a great picture of what Jesus brings. I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you. And I love these words right here because we do what we want to do. And I will move you to follow. I'll move you to follow because I'm going to change your heart. I'm going to change your very motivations and desires. I will move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You say, Pastor Jeff, you're starting a series on the heart. You know, as a, as a pastor, how does that really affect you? Well, here's what I've learned. The mind justifies what the heart desires, and that's why Jesus has to change our hearts. No matter what stage you are, from a very beginning understanding of who Jesus is to wherever you're at in your spiritual journey, all of us need to be acutely aware that our minds have the ability to justify whatever our hearts desires and that we have to return back to that place where we continually yield our hearts to Jesus. I started a couple of years ago praying a prayer for all of us. One of the things I love about you is the, the spirit of innocence that our, our church has and as a church grows and as we are, are expanding to campuses and as we're, we're, we're in an expansion season as a church and all of these things, my heart always is that we wouldn't lose sight of our first love, Jesus, and we wouldn't lose that, 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 that childlike innocence. And that's what people feel when they come here. It's, it's not a program. It's not just a service. It's, this, it's this, this love that we have for Jesus which causes us to love others and it's what we see, even the culmination of Jesus according to Ezekiel 36, where in Matthew 22, when the Pharisees were trying to break all this down with Jesus and trick him in Matthew 22, 
A lawyer comes and just brings some question after Jesus had dealt with the Sadducees, and they said, what's the most important commandment? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart. The simplicity of that. So I began just praying, Lord, Lord, help us protect the innocence. Help us just love you with all our heart. Keep our hearts in the right place. You know, and ultimately for all of us to do that, I have to do that. So this year during our prayer time at Prepare, I wrote, I always put some things on the back of my phone because I have my phone with me all the time that I'm thinking on, praying about, meditating. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God is the verse I've been praying for myself. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Not perfect, not having it all together, but Lord, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Now I'm just, I'm giving you a model of something. Even when you come to church, even when you come to worship, last weekend I was with my son on a senior trip and we, we were in this place and they, they wanted me to preach at this church. And I said, you know what, I, I don't want to preach. I just want to go to church. You know, as a pastor, a lot of times it's cool just to go to church. Now I go to church a lot, but I'm thinking about, is it, are the lights going to work? Is the sound system going to blow up? You know, how's all this going to happen? And so I just went to church, sat kind of back in this section of a church. Man, I had a great time in worship. See, for me, worship is not a performance of a group of people. I come there to bring my affections to my Jesus. So I came and I just had a moment. Those people didn't know who I was. That was awesome. It's just me and Jesus. I just had a time there. It's just, Jesus, thank you for what you've done for me. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I was thinking about that on my phone. I had a great time. Then the pastor got up to preach. Guess what he preached on? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I took my little note section out on my phone there. Wasn't checking Google like some of y'all do while I'm preaching. <laughs> Just, Jesus, I bring my heart to you fresh and new. What do you want to tell me? Write down a few things there. Not condemnation, conviction, relationship, a son talking to a father. What do you want to do? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You say, man, that seems so far from where I am. Well, let me back it up for just a moment here before I pray for you. How does Jesus change our hearts? He gives us a new heart. That's what Ezekiel just told us. He deals with the medical condition of our spiritual hearts that they are sick. And he doesn't say, modify your heart, fix your own heart, improve your own heart. He says, I want to give you a new heart. And at the very central, what is this all about? By the way, no matter how long you've been walking with God, you should get excited about this truth over and over again. That on your worst day, with all of your sin, that there is none righteous, no, not one. That even the good things you bring before him that are filthy rags, he comes to you in the depth of your brokenness and in the depth of your inability to fix yourself. And he says, you know why Jesus is my hero? He says, no other religion does this. I give you a new heart. I give you myself. My blood is sufficient to pay the price for every sin, every inadequacy, every lie, everything that you are not in and of yourself. I give you a new heart. And the same power that raises Jesus from the dead comes to live on the inside of you. That's why Jesus is my hero, and that's a good place to clap. That's, I don't know what other message you've heard. See, we, we learn culturally when you're little. I know I got this a lot. Behave. My parents believed in spanking. They believed in spanking where you committed the foul, too. It wasn't like we're going in the back bedroom. It was in Kroger. Wow. <laughs> And so I learned to avoid pain, you better behave. And then you get in school and you perform to get the grade. And what happens is if you're not careful, your heart toward God is that you think the basis of your relationship. This does not remove the standards. Jesus said, I came to fulfill these laws and decrees and these things that are righteous standards. He didn't say, I came to just take all of it away and say, we don't need any of that. Of course, the ceremonial side of it, but God's plans and God's precepts and God's patterns are all there. He said, but look, I'm gonna move you in a way that you can fulfill them. I'm gonna change, why? Because we do what we 
want to, he says, I'm going to change your want to. I'm going to change your want to. The mind will justify what the heart desires, so that's why Jesus gives us a new heart. The second thing is, what we, what we do to continue this process is he helps us retrain our desires. The first part is salvation. You've heard people say, ask Jesus into your heart. What is that? Well, it's Jesus giving you a new heart. It's the essence of the message of Jesus Christ. Gives you a new heart. He, 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 that's salvation, and that's more holistic than just going to heaven. That's that you become a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things become new. But then as a result of that new heart, again, not something that you earn, not something you obtain, not something you figure out, something you receive. You receive a new heart. And once you receive it, then you start having this place where you retrain your desires and you go, how do you retrain your desires? Not by obtaining something new, but continue to elevate that which you have received. Going back to that place of where you receive that, that love, that simplicity. The Bible talks about not getting taken away from the simplicity of this message that you've received a new heart. And so worship at its very essence is continuing to set your affections on him. You're like, that worship thing, I don't get it. What is it? And this is not a message on worship. Worship is your whole life. It's just putting God at the center of your whole life. You can worship him when you work. You can worship him when you parent your children. You can worship him. And so it's, it's, it's a lifestyle of elevating God above it all. Over and over and over, setting your affections, setting your desires. And some people say, well, I don't know how to do that. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Have you ever met a grandparent who became a grandparent for the first time? You get around them and be like, hey, how's it going at work? Well, you know, we're doing this. How's it? Have you seen my grandkids? <laughs> it's coming in the conversation. You find someone who has a hobby, you find someone who has a passion, it will bubble out of them. And that's the same thing that you say, okay, how are we gonna learn in this series? Our heart, everything flows out of it. I want you to think about a circumstance or an issue right now in your life where you go, I know that's not God's purpose and plan in my life. I know that's not the right flow. Everything flows from it. How do you deal with it? You can try to ignore it, you can try to get religious, you can try to fix it yourself. Let me recommend a different thing. Elevate Jesus. Start worshiping him. Replace those desires. And I wanna tell you, for some of you new to this, if you start learning how to elevate Jesus, go back to that simple place where he gives you a new heart, over time you will be amazed. You will be amazed at what falls off of your life. You'll, you'll, you'll be walking out here going, man, I don't even, man, I don't desire that. I don't, I don't, I, I don't know, I don't know how that, because why? He, he changes your desires. That's even when we come together for corporate worship. Why do we have this time, not that we're not worshiping when we give or when you listen to the message, but why do we have this time? When we started our church, we never desired just to have a bunch of cool people singing songs with great lights to have an entertainment time where we sit there and go, well, that was good, you know, that was theologically accurate, this, 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 No, 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 we wanna bring our affections to him. And as our church grows and more of you gather and you come in and, and this, we wanna retrain you on this. Well, we desire to be a worshiping church. When we come together, and I'm not talking about form, some of you are like, you're never gonna get me to do that. Just, just be careful if you start setting your affections. You with me? I was a pretty well put together guy till I met this girl named Brandy. I got love, woo, now I do crazy stuff. You fall in love, who knows what you may do? And what do I mean by that? Not talking about just form, I'm talking about heart. And so we don't come in for a performance. We're not coming in for an activity to check off of the week. We're coming in to set our affections and our desires on the one who needs to reign supreme above our social media, above our activities, above our busyness, above our stress, above all the stuff that can harden our hearts. We set him up at the highest place. And every time I do, let your cross be lifted high. It's changing my desires. It's changing my affections. I asked one of the doctors in our church to give me one of these. Borrow, that is. 
I don't really know how to use it. I know you stick these in your ears. I could put this on your chest and do what they do, breathe deep. I don't know what I would hear. I don't know what would happen. I don't, I don't really know what I'm looking for. Because, see, I'm, I'm not a medical heart doctor. I'm a spiritual heart doctor. Um, but they have a way of checking. They know how to check. They also, when I have my yearly physical with my doctor who's actually in the service, who now that I'm over 40 does really bad things to me. <laughs> That's a different message. They hook me up with these electrical things. You know, and I'm sitting there, you know, you're anxious, which probably reads out, right? You know, like, how's it doing? Calm down, Pastor. And so they're checking the electrical, right? If you have some medical heart things, they can inject dye, and people who know how to read that can tell you if you have blockage. And, and you say, well, that requires professionals to read out where our hearts are, but here's, here's what's awesome about our relationship with Jesus. He cares about our hearts so much. The biggest part of the battle is not going to the physical. It's not finding the right person to read out. It's it's just simply pausing long enough to say, what do you want to say to me about my heart? That's all you, as you do that, he'll begin to reveal. So with the busyness of your life, with the requirements of your life, with the brokenness of your heart, here's what I would like to ask you. Have you checked your heart lately? Have you had just a moment where you say, God, I want to I wanna just kind of, open up and let you check my heart where it is. And I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and we're gonna have just a moment where you're gonna just say, God, maybe you've been seeing some effects of some things, but God wants to show you where some of that is. Some of you here may say, you can get a new heart. Yes, you can. And it's real simple just by saying, Jesus, here I am. I bring to you my deceived heart, my, my, my jaded heart, whatever I, mean, I bring to you, my broken heart. And I believe, Jesus, that you died for me, rose from the dead, come into my heart and, and save me. Become my Jesus. If you prayed that prayer, I'm gonna ask you to let us know. Maybe come to 101 after this service or maybe come forward at the end of this service. Second of all, some of you may have been around some things, had some religious things, but you're not really seeing the changes. You're not seeing the, you say, well, I've kind of been around it, but I haven't seen change. Well, God wants you to come back to that center place where you elevate Jesus to the highest place. Let him have the affections and the desires of your heart. Some of you have a broken heart, and I pray right now for those with a broken heart. Jesus, you tell us, Luke chapter 4, that you're anointed to heal the broken heart. We thank you today, Lord, that even over the next few weeks, we're gonna circle in our Bibles, Proverbs 4. We're gonna let you look at our hearts and Lord, you're gonna help us. We're gonna see a flow of that even into the, the very things of our lives that you wanna change in Jesus' name.